this presentation is both theoretical, methodological, but also practical. I'd like to uh, examine the possibilities that uh, uh, historical uh, institutionalism are, uh, well, is offering for us uh, urban historians. And it begins with a good news and a bad news. Uh, the question that was posed to me by the organizers was, uh, could critical junctures and path dependence structure the history of European dividing in the 20th century? And uh, you see that every word in this question is uh, important and itself poses a uh, question. And uh, the good news is that we have all been practicing historical institutionalism even without knowing it, because this theory is, well, for two reasons maybe, because this theory is so pervasive, has such an influence that everybody uh, is uh, submitted to this influence. And uh, the, all, the other reason that one might be less uh, uh, pertinent uh, is that uh, this theory is sometimes tautologic, this theory is sometimes too obvious, and uh, every uh, uh, research attitude that tries to reflect on processes uh, could be mirrored into uh, this theory. The bad news is that if you take the theory uh, seriously, uh, you can't be satisfied with this kind of raw influence of historical institutionalism in our uh, field of study. So uh, that's why I will be starting here from uh, the theory itself and I'll be going uh, slowly uh, in the direction of uh, uh, urban history. Uh, and so uh, that's how I define the object of this talk an examination of the potentiality of historical institutionalism in uh, urban history. I'd like to start with uh, some considerations on the roots of uh, this uh, theory. And some of these roots are surprisingly familiar to us. Uh, uh, it's the influence of uh, German historicism of the uh, last decades of the 19th century. Uh, and uh, the author that uh, I've been uh, reading most uh, in this uh, uh, trend of uh, publication is uh, von Schmoller. And uh, von Schmoller, it also because he, he was in Strasbourg and he studied uh, the guilds of Strasbourg, and uh, this is one of the roots of, uh, well, uh, historical, of institutionalism in general, let's say. Uh, this study of the textile workers of the guilds of Strasbourg, in which von Schmoller uh, ins insists on notions of institutional change, uh, the creation of institutions, how institutions shape the life and work of people, and how institutions are specialized into cities. So I thought it was an important starting point for us because we always see this theory as something external coming upon us uh, from the social sciences, from political science. No, there was also urban history at the beginning among the roots of this uh, theory. Uh, then it developed uh, mostly in the field of uh, economics. And uh, for maybe you are familiar with this uh, development, it starts in the last uh, years of the 19th century with uh, Veblen, uh, a scholar of Norwegian origin, uh, who uh, reflected on the notion of consumption and on the role of individual decisions into uh, the mechanisms of consumption and introduced uh, considerations on behavior, on choice, on uh, kind of complexification of decision-making processes. And uh, in the field of economics, this is uh, a very important route. And also a new definition, of a new approach to institutions. Institutions are, with Veblen, not static things anymore, not only bureaucratic or legal things anymore. Veblen proposes 
uh, a study of institutions as a way of thinking society. And uh, this has a huge influence in the 20th century uh, as far as institutionalism is concerned. So uh, another huge influence is that of Hamilton, of course, who coined uh, uh, this uh, term of uh, uh, institutionalism and uh, uh, in the field of economics. And of course, a huge influence also uh, in the uh, 20s and 30s in the US uh, with uh, someone like John Commons, who uh, uh, focused on uh, uh, issues of collective decisions and, uh, and who uh, proposed a theory of the interaction between individuals and institutions. So these are the intellectual roots of uh, uh, institutionalism that are important for us uh, in order to reflect on uh, the potential impact on, uh, on our history. Another important reference for us is, of course, Wesley Mitchell and uh, uh, his uh, reflection of non-economic uh, cycles. Uh, and uh, for those who are among you interested uh, in uh, this uh, genealogy of institutionalism, here are two references that I use in my teaching and that I think are uh, relevant. Uh, uh, there is this book uh, by uh, Lord Atsoli, Economy Politique uh, of Common, and uh, this uh, a book by Geoffrey Oxon on the evolution of institutional economics. And that's where you find uh, uh, reflections on the key concepts and central notions of uh, institutionalism. Of course, there are interaction between uh, the framework, the rules, and the individuals, and uh, the notion of constant learning and mutual shaping of people, individuals, groups, and institutions, and also a very important notion, uh, that of uh, Darwinism uh, through uh, reflection on uh, evolution. So uh, this is the intellectual uh, framework uh, that I wanted to uh, insist on. And uh, uh, of course, uh, this theory was less developed in Europe, in spite of some uh, initial influences, but it had a huge influence uh, in uh, the US in the 30s, uh, sometimes mythical, but because some scholars have been uh, criticizing uh, this mechanistic vision of a new deal as a result of the influence of institutionalism. But anyway, uh, uh, it was a central argument in debates in social sciences in the 30s, and it was also a contested theory. And that will explain some uh, further uh, changes after World War II. Contested for uh, various reasons. And the most important reason uh, is uh, the development of structuralism, of structuralist theories in social sciences that are not always compatible with uh, two mechanistic theories of institutionalism. So there was kind of a clash and uh, uh, in the 40s and 50s institutionalism was labelled as too mechanistic, was labelled as too, uh, uh, as unable to tackle the complexity of social relations and the complexity of historical uh, evolution. And uh, among these uh, 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 rejections of the theory, uh, uh, Allman and Powell are uh, the most important. Um, but I'd like to focus on the revival because it brings us slowly uh, in the direction of urban history. Uh, this is a revival and uh, the uh, categories that I use here are from uh, this uh, article by Erhard Friedberg and uh, uh, which is a reaction to another article that I quote later by Taylor and uh, uh It's uh, also an effort of contextualization. There was a revival in, uh, of what was labeled new institutionalism, neo-institutionalism in the US in the post-war period, but it's difficult to understand from a European point of view because Europe hasn't experienced 
the dominant influence of the first form of, uh, of institutionalism and has not experienced the rejection of institutionalism in uh, uh, the uh, uh, 40s and, and 50s. So it's difficult to understand this neo and new institutionalism uh, surge because we didn't see really the influence of the previous phases. And that's why, uh, for us, I think this article that which contextualizes the emergence of uh, new institutionalism is, uh, is uh, important. And I quote uh, Ritter, uh, it's difficult to understand in Europe as we didn't experience the excesses of the behaviorists. So we, it was difficult for us to perceive the pertinence of uh, the emergence of, uh, of new institutionalism. And once again, it's in economics that this revival is happening. And uh, uh, one of the most quoted articles is by uh, Ronald Coase, The Problem of Social Cost. But it's, it's mostly in the 70s that uh, the theoretical proposals are formulated uh, most clearly. Uh, the term is coined by Oliver Williamson in 55, New Institutional Economics, and uh, with a new definition of institutions, with a new distinction between institution and organization, and also with warnings, uh, which are important for us to not to confound both notions and to reflect on the difference between institution, the process of institution change, creation, etc., and the general organization of society. And uh, this is a theoretical approach that became dominant in uh, the uh, 80s and 90s, once again, as a, a reaction against uh, uh, the dominance of uh, uh, the theory of structural functionalism that was uh, dominant uh, in, the, uh, in the 60s. Uh, so it's kind of an aggiornamento of uh, the, the theory. And the main entry is the study of how institutions interact with uh, society, shape society, and in return are shaped by uh, society. And institutions are not only seen as rules, or a set of rules, uh, they are also uh, pertaining to the construction of a general social horizon, and uh, there are also references to this notion uh, that comes from the German theoretician Jaus, the horizon of expectation of society, and which is part of this uh, dialogue in the shaping of institution. Uh, in the 80s, progressively, institutionalism also took into account uh, some proposals that came from cognitive sciences and uh, uh, introduced a complexification of change and also the interaction of individuals between something that was the fuzzy until then, uh, the institution and uh, the processes that changed them. And three branches emerged from this new posture in uh, institutionalism. The branch that is generally labeled as the rational choice, uh, which insists on the rationality of individual choices, what is called generally sociological institutionalism, uh, with uh, a focus on social habits, on uh, uh, what sociologists call the quests for insertion, and the one that we are focusing here today is historical institutionalism. And uh, the general idea that these three branches, well, it's not such a, it's not a tree, uh, but these three branches have in common is the belief, the general idea that institutions have an influence on actors and uh, social processes. And for uh, such definitions, uh, uh, you might be interested in this article uh, by uh, Philip Zeznik, Zeznik uh, Institutionalism Old and New, which, I'm, which I find very pedagogical in uh, uh, bringing us into this uh, theoretical journey. Another important article was in 96, and it's uh, uh, an article that is very often quoted in reflections on historical institutionalism, uh, and in general, uh, these three branches of institutionalism, 
Peter Hall and Rosemary Taylor, political sciences and the three new institutionalisms. And the typology of these different research attitudes is very clear in this article that was published in Political Studies. Uh, so as far as historical institutionalism is concerned, uh, the first important thing is an expansion of the definition of what is an institution. Uh, so we saw that it's not only a set of rules, uh, but it is also what uh, is uh, bringing the rules of the game, what is bringing the general framework. It is also not something static, it is something uh, the object, that is also the object of society social science is to understand its processes of change and evolution. Uh, this is uh, uh, what uh, uh, scholars focusing on historical uh, institutionalism are insisting on. And uh, another uh, characteristic of historical institutionalism is to expand also the focus on social groups. Uh, it's uh, or a way to distantiate themselves from mechanistic visions of decision-making processes that is taking into account broader social groups in the perception of what is a decision and how a decision is shaping society and institutions. And uh, with this belief that actors both shape and are shaped by uh, history. A huge influence and it's something, uh, it's, it's a reference that is important for us in urban history. It's short, it's short in his books, book uh, on big structures, large processes, and huge comparisons. Sorry, the picture of the book is not uh, uh, very uh, readable, but I wanted the true book uh, and not, uh, not uh, a screenshot. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, this book has had a uh, huge influence as it poses the steps of a method and is kind of a companion to research. It's a, a, a book that reflects on the very implementation of uh, what a process reflecting on uh, uh, decision-making processes, on uh, the evolution of institutions could be. Another uh, seminal book is by Freda uh, Skokpol in 77, States and Social Revolution, in which she focuses on the French, Russian and Chinese revolutions. And here we have the implementation of a theory that is uh, uh, kind of a model of studies in uh, historical institutionalism with a building of a typological approach and also here this book is kind of a companion into the theory through uh, uh, these uh, three case studies here so it's not very readable because I put the picture of the book itself uh, but I'm sure it's in uh, uh, libraries um, and uh, if you want uh, definitions of historical institutionalism uh, two important and very <coughs> accessible articles, one by Elizabeth Sander, Historical Institutionalism in the Oxford Handbook of Political Institutions. So uh, if you uh, uh, think you need this approach in your PhD, uh, don't hesitate to refer to this uh, very pedagogical definition. And if you read French, uh, also a very uh, pedagogical uh, uh, definition by Sven Schneider, Neo Institutionalism Historic in the Dictionnaire des Politiques Publiques. It is also something I used uh, in my teaching. And with the same question uh, that is uh, presented as central to historical institutionalism is why and how, sorry, not who, insti institutions change. So here are the key concepts and then we'll examine how they can have an impact on our research in urban studies, the key concepts of historical institutionalism. And uh, for that, uh, uh, there is also an important article by uh, Ruth Collier and David Collier, uh, Shaping the Political Arena, 
uh, with a reflection on critical junctures. Uh, the first key concept is that of sequence. And uh, this is an invitation for researcher to track and decipher the sequences related to behaviors, decisions, and changes. And you see that uh, for every field of study that we are active in, uh, this is an attitude that uh, uh, is important to us. That is, how can I uh, decipher the sequences of history in which something decisive is happening? And uh, how do I have the instruments of understanding, deciphering, and explaining these mechanisms of change. Another key concept is the concept of path dependence. And path dependence was something very vague in the beginning, and uh, uh, it was something uh, people in political sciences have been reflecting a lot on, and the definitions and practical and pedagogical uh, handbooks have been more precise. Uh, between the 80s and now, but path dependence begins as a very pragmatic diagnosis is that uh, it is very difficult to reverse the course of causalities and that once you are into a course of causalities it's very difficult to go back or to take another road so uh, the path dependence is kind of an intellectual metaphor that speaks very well to scholars and uh, it is also uh, a reflection on the fact that alternative decisions that were possible at a certain point are always more difficult to make once you are on a specific road and here again there is this uh, kind of uh, schematic metaphor uh, in the path dependence uh, concept and also the thing that uh, choices in decision making processes are de facto limited by previous decisions and not only by the result of the decision but also by the context not only about what you decide but who it is, is deciding and that's where it's crucial as for historical institutionalism and the very definition of what an, an institution is and then how it is uh, working and, and also, uh, also another very important uh, concept in path dependence is it's the inertia of previous decision and you see that uh, we are beginning to uh, open uh, uh, windows of opportunity for urban historians uh, uh, and reflections, not only as implementation possibilities of this uh, theoretical approach, but also as a possible discussion of uh, a critical approach. Because as urban historians, we have something to say, not only uh, to learn from uh, the theory or to implement or try the theory, but I think that the decision making processes that we are dealing with and their impact on space and society are have also in well something to teach about the theory uh, itself. Path dependence also explains the persistence of institutions. So institutions themselves are defined by path dependencies, mm -hmm. that is the shaping of the institution is and it's uh, and the way it evolves in history is uh, uh, shaped by a series of decisions and actions that were taken in the context of this uh, very institution. Another key concept is that of critical junctures. And critical junctures here too. In the beginning it was a very vague metaphor. Uh, so there is this road of path dependence and there is a point, a crossroad, something but which opens a possibility and between the 90s and the beginning of our century uh, reflections on critical junctions have become more precise, more articulated and the metaphor has uh, been complexified and uh, so a critical juncture uh, is now defined and here again uh, 
uh, refer to this article by Collier and Collier, uh, as a window of political opportunities, a moment of possible change. And it's not only a crossroad, it's a moment in which new definitions of institution, evolutions of the definition are possible and are made possible either by actors or by the general context. And here again, it's important for our uh, approach to have an issue. Uh, another characteristic of this theory is that uh, it mostly relies on case studies and an empirical approach. Uh, historical institutionalism is a theory that has been not only tested through case study, but has emerged from case studies. And that's important for us too, because uh, in our profession, we are kind of, of uh, uh, we have kind of a fetishism for uh, empirical studies. Uh, we think it's important, we think it's the base of our work. And uh, so that's also why this theory might be interesting for us, because it's been shaped and reshaped and deshaped by uh, uh, this empirical approach. But it also poses some questions, uh, which uh, also uh, refer to this uh, uh, problem of a mechanistic vision of society. That is, uh, path dependence sometimes suggests a to mechanistic vision of causalities. And uh, uh, it's also, uh, there's also a risk of overestimation of the influence of decisions. Uh, because we know very well uh, in urban history that decisions not only are complex, but also not always are implemented. And maybe uh, this theory is suggesting too much and, and is building a belief in the influence of uh, institutions. Uh, so historical institutionalism has had a huge influence in many uh, fields of social sciences. But in this very important uh, uh, book uh, uh, at Oxford University Press uh, by Fioretto, Saletti, and Scheingate uh, about uh, this kind of typology of historical institutionalism, there's nothing really about urban history or urban studies or planning, etc. Uh, so uh, maybe there's something uh, to reflect on or to do. But there's might be an inspiration by Peter Hall. Uh, this is this idea that politics are a process structured in space and time. And here again, this is exactly the kind of things we are uh, reflecting on. Uh, this risk of being too mechanistic, which for us uh, is uh, is uh, disturbing because uh, all our work is to uh, deconstruct mechanistic visions of planning and urban history, uh, has been answered by uh, Peter and Rosemary uh, Taylor. Um, answered uh, against as a as a warning uh, to take into account dimensions of complexity and as a warning to complexify the very uh, concept of path dependence. Uh, that is, uh, don't be a caricature of uh, the uh, explorator of path dependence because there is a path dependence in path dependence. So uh, uh, this is a dimension that might be also important for us. Here I found another good news for us because sometimes urban historians might be lost in theory. Uh, the good news is that political scientists too, uh, as uh, 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 these authors called Pearson and Fedas who are uh, central in the uh, promotion of historical institutionalism, uh, uh, even political scientists don't know that they de facto uh, practice a raw version of historical institutionalism. So, uh, and they denounce uh, this attitude, which is a kind of this Molière attitude uh, of, uh, of 
a poet who is doing poetry without knowing that it's poetry. And uh, so they denounce uh, this uh, pervasive uh, and uh, vague influence of the theory. But they also propose kind of a program that could be uh, useful for us. Historical institutionalists, institutionalists analyze organizational configurations where other look at particular settings in isolation. Uh, uh, they pay attention to critical junctures and long time processes where overlooked only at slices of time. And here, uh, uh, there is an invitation for us urban historian to uh, tackle uh, this, uh, this uh, theory. In political sciences, debates have been also very harsh about uh, historical institutionalism. Some also denounced the risk of intellectual chaos. And chaos in the meaning of end of the world. Uh, and this is this interesting uh, article by Chu Yu Ma, uh, who denounced the incompatibility ontological, philosophical, of historical institutionalism with the very Newtown foundation of our rational thinking. And this is also an invitation for us to reflect on in urban history about how decisions interfere, interact with rationality and how complexity uh, is a necessary entry into the understanding of decisions and of uh, the transformation of uh, uh, society in general. This, uh, com this necessity of a complex approach might for us be an invitation to look at uh, the French geographic tradition of the theoretization of complexity. And uh, uh, with uh, writings by Denis Puma uh, or by Bernard Le Petit, uh, who are among uh, Bernard Le Petit, who is one of the founders of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the Association of Urban History, uh, European Association of Urban History, and who was one of the scholars who reflected on this uh, dialogue between uh, this uh, French tradition of geography and these impulses in political sciences coming from uh, America. And uh, their approach of complexity might be an answer to what was, well, in a character caricatural way denounced as uh, a risk of uh, chaos. And it's also an invitation for us to reflect on uh, the urban space. What is also important for us is uh, to reflect on uh, history. Because too often, it's not history that is being made in uh, historical institutionalism. It's genealogy. And it's different. Because in history, you are trying to understand a concept, a context at a particular moment of time, and you are trying to, on an horizontal way, to understand the various interactions in society. In genealogy, you are tracking causalities, and uh, you might too easily find what you are looking for, which doesn't mean that you found an explanation, but doesn't mean that you have understood the complexity of the decision-making processes. So uh, this is another uh, warning that is important for us, and. Uh, uh, here I quoted uh, this uh, interesting article by Sudavi, uh, Foster and Mills. Uh, genealogy is not history, and as far as urban history is concerned, it might be our uh, uh, contribution to reflections on historical institutionalism. That is, uh, uh, we are not interested in genealogy, but maybe there is something to learn from history. Uh, and history as a method. Another thing that we might be uh, uh, able to propose is uh, uh, a complexification of path dependence. Uh, because 
due to our archival work in urban history, due to our ability to track the complexity of decisions, to track uh, the various actors that are active in the decision. Uh, maybe we have uh, uh, facilitated access to this dimension of complexity. And maybe we are able to propose a definition of path dependence that is more articulated, that is more nuanced, than the one that is too often referring to this genealogical entry uh, and violent entry into history, intrusion. And here uh, I quoted uh, this interesting uh, article by Hermann Schwartz, down the wrong path, and, uh, which is a reflection on the perversion and the potential risk of practicing path dependence on a true caricatural uh, way. Uh, history is a method and not the selection of events in the artificial reconstruction of the chain of causalities. And uh, this is something urban history has been proposing in the last decades. That is, uh, let's not accept in an undiscussed way these causalities that we have been taught about these uh, mechanistic procedures from one period to the other and let us discuss the complexity of every one of these uh, contexts. Also discussions in which we might be pertinent are the ones on critical junctures. And, uh, here uh, you might be interested in this article by Giovanni Capoccia on uh, uh, critical juncture. Uh, that is, uh, you can't imagine a critical juncture as this magical moment that happens every while in which suddenly possibilities open. This is also too mechanistic and this is also something in which we have something to say as urban historians. That is, uh, well, critical junctures are everywhere, all the time. And you don't have this uh, dependence, critical juncture, but it, <laughs> and this is something we might have something to say about because our research in the archives is something that gives us access to this uh, dimension. Other thing in which we might have something to say is uh, uh, change. Change here again, not as a magical moment in which, in which possibilities uh, uh, emerge. Uh, but change, and, and also, you know, that in historical institutionalism, uh, which started with uh, uh, studies on revolutions, studies on moments of the creation of new institutions, a lot of studies on the European Union, for example, etc., uh, there is uh, this uh, belief in a specific moment. And what, as urban historians, we have been doing for decades is also to show that things are more complicated that uh, sometimes the, the relationship between ideology and the actual transformation of the built environment is not so direct. There are mediations, there are negotiations, uh, there are different actors, etc. So here again, we might have uh, something to say. And uh, uh, we might also be interested in this suggestion by Peter Stier and King. Uh, uh, they say, if you want to avoid being too mechanistic in practicing historical institutionalism, focus on conflicts. And this is something we've been doing in urban history. That is, the conflict as a moment in which you are able, because conflicts produce archives, and urban history is full of conflicts, and uh, 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 conflicts produce mediations, negotiations, and thus also archives. And so focus on conflicts you'll be able to, for, to uh, uh, decipher in a uh, uh, way more uh, uh, nuanced and uh, a more uh, articulated way the complexity of uh, social processes. Another step in our direction is what uh, the belief El Cadotier and Kring call the necessary materialism 
of historical institutionalism. And uh, it's not only a metaphor, uh, but urban history is a good entry into this necessary materialism of uh, uh, historical institutionalism and uh, uh, the importance of empirical <coughs> research. So uh, now I'll try to illustrate some uh, approaches in uh, urban history. An interesting uh, example of implementation of historical institutionalism in urban history is by Zach Taylor uh, about planning cultures. And you might be aware of this uh, uh, article in the Town Planning Review a few years ago, uh, in which uh, Zach Taylor reflects on the possible virtues of an approach inspired by institutionalism, neo-institutionalism. I argue that the new institutionalist paradigm, particularly historical institutionalism, can provide a more precise exploratory framework for comparative research on planning systems and practices. So this is one of the most precise examples of uh, an attempt to use this uh, theory into uh, the study of, uh, of uh, planning history. But also it is a list of difficulties, it is also a list of obstacles, a list of uh, simplifications that we might want to avoid. So uh, this article is also kind of a, of a warning. Uh, another interesting implementation in our field of studies uh, is by El uh, about uh, the Amsterdam airport. Uh, following in the archives a series of decisions and interpreting them according to the theory of uh, past dependence. And seeing the transformation of the actual urban morphology as a result of successive collective arrangements. But it might be our colleague Andre Sorensen, who has, as the title of his, uh, one of his articles suggests, who has taken most seriously uh, this uh, challenge of historical institutionalism in urban history. Uh, uh, I refer here to an article published uh, a few years ago in uh, Planning Perspectives, taking path dependence seriously. And uh, this, is, I invite uh, uh, PhD uh, students here to read this article with the question, uh, what about my own research? Uh, what about uh, the possible reflections on path dependence in the processes that I am analyzing? And, uh, uh, what is, uh, what Sorensen is proposing is a research attitude for the historians through uh, the use of this concept of uh, path dependence. Uh, it's, it's historical institutionalist approaches to the understanding of institutions path dependence, positive, but positive feedback effects in public policies offer a robust theoretical framework and valuable set of conceptual and analytical tools. And so uh, uh, Sorensen, among us urban historians, is the one who has been trying most to uh, implement uh, this kind of uh, approach. For him, it's also a way to solve, and uh, uh, it's an echo to uh, reflections that were yesterday about global history, to solve the risk of Eurocentric visions of urban history. And uh, uh, this is a way also to uh, resolve and to answer uh, to some objections that us urban historians are confronted to as far, uh, as, far as our practice of comparatism is concerned. That is, uh, here is a proposition by uh, Sorensen. I argue that the historical institutionalist approach to the comparison of particular urban institutions that examine the critical gesture of institutional development, patterns of public dependence, and development pathways offers a reconceptualization and reframing of comparative studies that can answer 
to objections against our pragmatic and sometimes ide ideologically connected practice of comparatism. So for Sorensen, there is kind of a virtue of uh, historical institutionalism for us uh, historians. And he also proposes kind of a uh, handbook and practical handbook uh, and with a theme how to track critical juncture, how to define a critical juncture in uh, urban history. Uh, uh, for him, uh, and he's been studying uh, municipal reforms, for example, for him, uh, uh, tracking this kind of moment is an entry into uh, the understanding of the general transformation of cities. Another offer that is important uh, in uh, the implementation of historical institutionalism in urban history is someone that Sabine quoted yesterday and who is also uh, one of the uh, most important scholars in environmental history, in the history of urban infrastructures. Uh, it's Martin Melosi. And uh, Martin Melosi uh, proposed, and, or reflected at least, on a possible marriage between uh, urban history and historical institutionalism. Uh, uh, his book, The Sanitary City, is intended as a test of this possible uh, marriage. And uh, he wrote a few articles and made a few lectures about his own experience of implementing, uh, uh, of tracking path dependence uh, in the decision. Of course, his entry through infrastructure is particularly relevant because once an infrastructure is in the ground, the inertia, the physical, morphological inertia in urban history is huge and the path dependence is, can be read along the tube of your sewers of, uh, which is here for a century and which will cross several periods and which you can take as a concrete metaphor of path dependence. So uh, read the sanitary city and also read these various articles in which Martin Melosi reflects on path Dependence. And uh, another important article is again by Andres Sorensen, who was in a session that we organized in the last uh, conference of the European, of the, uh, European Association of European History in Rome uh, 18 months ago. Uh, it is uh, a kind of typology of what could be. Uh, an historical institutionalist approach. And uh, uh, this paper uh, in uh, planning, theory, and practice, uh, institution and urban space, uh, is uh, very pedagogical as for this building of this typology, with three main points that again are very relevant for all of us and for all the various works that we are uh, doing uh, now. Uh, it's a reflection on what is an urban institution. And there are, for it, three various urban institutions, three kinds of institutions, urban, urban and property institutions, infrastructure institutions, and <coughs> governance institutions. And in this article, it suggests a method inspired by historical institutionalism to uh, analyze institutional change in this typology and uh, to implement uh, this kind of theory as a way to complexify our vision of decision-making processes and institutional change uh, in urban history. So don't hesitate to uh, go to this article. There are other research attitudes that we can adopt as urban historians and uh, through which we can not only learn from is historical institutionalism, but we can also bring new elements into debates about historical institutionalism. Uh, so there is also, of course, this exploration of the trilogy 
institutional trilogy that Ransen suggested. Uh, but there is also something comparative to do about municipal government and municipal government not as this magic moment of uh, municipal reforms and municipal transformation, but also the inertia of older institutions, <coughs> older forms, into what we perceive as the modernization of urban institutions. Something also about the municipal welfare, because debates on historical institutionalism are focused in political sciences on the welfare state, social policies, but something that is floating above the ground. We have a way in urban history to confront this dimension through, for example, municipal welfare, to something concrete, to space, to the transformation of urban morphology. And uh, this might be for us an interesting entry. Same thing as for social housing policies. That is, uh, uh, in contrast with people in, social, in uh, social sciences and in political sciences who reflect on uh, the impact of social policies and change in social policies uh, in a very uh, theoretical way or only reflecting on the, the change in these institutions, we have a way through social housing to see it in the morphology and then to discuss that uh, theory. Same thing as for infrastructure, as I evoked uh, about Melosi, that is, uh, uh, use the inertia of decision making processes in infrastructure as not only as a metaphor but as a way to track path dependencies, to track decision making processes and their inertia. And urban conflictuality and morphology. And my conclusion, because I'm afraid uh, it's time for that, is about how I tried in my own research to uh, not really implement, but to reflect on such uh, methodological and theoretical approaches. And uh, I think the moment in which I tried to do it uh, most seriously, like uh, Andres Sorensen would say, is uh, what was then my PhD about uh, uh, Rome at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. And here, I, I'd just like to evoke in a minute uh, a, few, uh, a few ways in which I tracked path dependence and uh, this kind of uh, things. You see here on uh, the cover of a book something that never existed, that is, a Tiber embankment with an open fall. But if you know Rome, you know that the Tiber embankment is very rigid and this is the core, the center of this book. I've been trying to decipher this critical juncture which has an inertia of centuries and that is the moment in which it was decided to do the embankment within the riverbed, that is within state territory and not on municipal territory like it would be like that, uh, that is within municipal uh, territory. So I tried to test an historical institutionalist approach through a study of infrastructure and urban morphology and showing the inertia of this decision, showing the actors that interacted when this decision uh, was made. And uh, I tried also to, to track the various possibilities that opened at a certain time and how these possibilities then closed, created path dependencies and uh, how new critical junctures uh, happened. So uh, this was uh, kind of uh, of a test of this uh, of this method. Uh, here is uh, how uh, now the uh, uh, riverbed are, are looking. So uh, on uh, state territory like Roman law states, that is the riverbed is from the state. And so state engineers, state budget, and uh, not municipal engineer. It, it was a time of ideological conflict 
between state and municipality, you know, because the Italian state was seen by the municipalities, which was dominated by the Catholic nobility, as an enemy. So uh, here again, the result of uh, an ideological conflict through uh, institutions. And uh, this will be my true conclusions. I tried to follow that into the 20th century. Uh, uh, so the Tiger Embankment, the collectors of the sewers, here again, it had to be on state territory, so into the river, and I tracked all the conflict uh, on the sewers between various institutions, and I tried to identify all uh, the actors. And uh, same thing as for the urbanization of the peripheries, through a conflict between state and municipality, and showing the conflicts, the mediations, the negotiations, and the impact of each of this micro decision onto the urban uh, space. And uh, you can uh, follow this track uh, up to the creation of uh, EU, uh, so the site of a uh, universal exhibition of 42 that never happened, uh, and up, up to the construction of the uh, Fiumicino Airport uh, in the periphery of Rome. Same logic uh, and these actors that uh, interact. And also, uh, I tried to study that through a study of water, because you know that Rome was conquered by Italy uh, on, in September 1870, but a few hours before the conquest, the Pope privatized water for 19, 90 years. And uh, uh, so Catholic private interests continued to control water until 1969, you see, and I studied the path dependence of this, uh, uh, of this decision uh, into uh, the governance of urban infrastructures. So these are only a few ideas on how uh, we can uh, use this theory, uh, uh, but also I think the main invitation is not, not to see the theory as something that would come from above, that would have a, that could be adopted or rejected. It is interesting because we are able to have a say in theoretical debates. I think that as urban historians, uh, with our practice of archives, with, with our uh, uh, access to the complexity of social change, uh, we have something to say in this sphere, and it's also an invitation for uh, PhD students here to use this possibility. Thank you.